Good morning. Good to see everybody here today. Uh, if you're joining us online, thank you for being with us as well. Uh, just for those who are here, a reminder that this is Communion Sunday. Hopefully everybody picked up a communion serving on the table in the lobby as you came in. And uh, just as you are here uh, in front of you, there is a sticker on the back of the pew. If you just take your smartphone out, you can scan the little island logo there as a QR code, and uh, it will bring up uh, how you can connect with us here at Bethel. And uh, there's some uh, different options for signing up for the newsletter and different things. So if you would like to do that, we would uh, appreciate the opportunity to connect with you. Uh, this morning, we do have Children's Church that's going to be after the service today, Children's Sunday School. And so we invite uh, all children to uh, come down and be a part of that. This morning, as we start, uh, we have the opening video for that. And then we will have the concluding video at the end of Sunday School. So here's our opening video. Cosby, let's play. Sorry. My Gouda pizza rolls needed more time in the oven. Gouda? That doesn't sound very Gouda. <laughs> I know that's cheesy. <laughs> anyway, the setup is done, so it's time to play the King's Torch. <clears throat> Set in the kingdom of Ecclesia, the king and all his knights. We know, we've played this game 17, 18. Played this game 18 times. But it's the nature of the game, you have to read everything. <clears throat> the king and all his knights must leave on a goodwill mission. And so the king left the court jester, the royal bard, and the castle cook in charge of the kingdom until he and his knights could return. But he did not leave the three empty-handed. He gave them the king's torch of wisdom to help guide them, to remember the king's words, and help them as they leave the new kingdom. Players must. Please, Brooklyn, can we just play? Okay, fine, you haters of the rules. Three, odd number. It's a chance card. Oh, I hate chance cards. Please be good. Please be good. <sighs> Nice. Use this card to call on the Torch of Wisdom for advice on a puzzle mission that's impossible and skip ahead. Boom! Our first mission card. From the Torch of Wisdom, this mission is for Cook.
Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you here to Bethel Evangelical Free Church in Miltonville. And welcome to those of you who are watching us on Facebook Live and those of you that will be watching later on YouTube. Please remember that after services, uh, I mean this Thursday, this Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m., we will be resuming our weekly Bible study. And we've been on a break for a while, so if you haven't been attending, this is a great opportunity to get started again. And uh, a quick reminder, as Pastor mentioned, children's Sunday school will be right after services. And please remember to keep praying for the conflict that's going on in Ukraine and with Russia. During this Easter season, my, during my Bible studies, I read an article by a David Yarborough. He's a pastor of St. Simon's Community Church down in Georgia. And it helped give me a, a new perspective on Lazarus that I didn't quite have before. And I'd like to share that with you today. Uh, forgive me if I do a little bit more reading than usual. Lord, the one you love is sick, said the message. Jesus' friend Lazarus was clinging to life when the message came from Lazarus' sisters, Martha and Mary. Jesus did not seem troubled by the news. As a matter of fact, he declared, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And then Jesus did the unexpected nothing. He stayed where he was for two more days and did absolutely nothing while Lazarus died. He had healed so many people before, so why didn't he go to Lazarus immediately and make them wait, make him well? How could he just sit there and do nothing? Don't you hate it when God doesn't do what you think he should? Most of us at one time in life have run into a situation where we thought, how could God allow this to happen? This is what Mary and Martha were thinking when Jesus finally arrived four days after Lazarus died. Both of the sisters questioned Jesus upon his arrival, saying, Lord, if you had been there, our brother would not have died. In their hearts, they were full of disappointment with God. Jesus had healed so many others. Why now did he not heal his own friend? How could Jesus have let them down like this? The sisters loved Jesus and believed in him, but were confused by his lack of action. In John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Then Jesus, the resurrection and the life, stepped up to the tomb and call, called forth Lazarus from the realm of the dead. Jesus' statement, I am the resurrection and the life, along with the power, his power to restore Lazarus from death, teach us everything the Bible has to say about heaven, hell, and the promise of eternal life being wrapped up in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He holds eternity in his hands, so he alone should be trusted with our eternity. The raising of Lazarus teaches us another lesson, though. When God seems to be doing nothing, he may, he may be doing more than you could ever imagine. Jesus had declared that Lazarus' sickness was for the glory of God. Jesus knew God would be totally glorified in the situation in hand when Lazarus died, and Jesus was just getting started. He used Lazarus' situation to bring the utmost glory to his father. No, he didn't do what we were expecting, heal Lazarus. He did something better. There would be times in the future when God doesn't do what we expect or what we think he should do. If he doesn't do what we think he should, it is very possible that God has something better in mind. Are you dealing with disappointment right now? 
Has God acted in a way that you would have not expected? And trust your situation to God and ask God to use your circumstances for his honor and glory. He may be doing more than you could ever imagine. If you don't believe that, just think of Lazarus. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we praise you for Patrick Charles, uh, um, Patrick Harris and, and Dylan, who were baptized last Sunday. We pray for Donna's co-workers, fathers, Sal and Freddie. There's been some improvement in both, but we continue to pray for their healing. We pray for Christina's mom, who will begin radiation treatment for the next two weeks, and continue to pray for Emily as she prepares to go to Cambodia at the end of May to share the gospel. We pray for Robbie's protection of physical, emotion, and spiritual health, and praise you that you have moved him into a safer situation. And we continue to pray for Karen's dental and foot issues. We continue to pray for Kenny's full recovery from the back surgery that he had this past Friday. And we pray for his peace and strength for his family. We pray for Frankie, who had a cyst removed this week, that everything will heal well. We pray for Nilsa's nephew David for his salvation and that he, he stays on his medication. And we pray for my daughter-in-law and her mother and the family as her dad, Scott, passed away Thursday. And we pray for wisdom and strength for friends of Shannon who are in the midst of divorce and especially for the well-being of the couple's two daughters. We thank you for all these things and much, much more under the name and authority of your son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you, Joe. Uh, as Joe mentioned, uh, we are praying for Emily Weinberg, who is going to Cambodia at the end of this month. Uh, it's hard to believe it's already May 1st, and uh, just a heads up, uh, Mother's Day is next Sunday, so just a heads up, there's your friendly reminder. Uh, but as we are uh, praying for Emily, uh, we uh, found out yesterday that uh, her funds needed has gone up, you know, the price of everything is going up, uh, so her funds that she needs are, is now $4,300, uh, so if you will continue to uh, contribute uh, with your finances, that would be a great blessing for her. Uh, through this month. Uh, if you give any money to Bethel, designated as missions, that will go toward Emily's trip to Cambodia. And also there's, uh, in the email, there's a direct link that you can give to Soon, which is Campus Crusade or Crew. Uh, you can give directly to her that way, and uh, she can get a report, and they will process that immediately. Uh, but finances are important. That is essential, but uh, even more essential than finances. Uh, we need prayer. Uh, she needs prayer for her as she goes and as she finishes her preparations. And as to be a part of that, to partner with her in prayer, uh, Kim has uh, some uh, a request of you uh, so that you can partner more intentionally with her in prayer. It's exciting that we have one of our own going far in the mission field. She's going around the world. And not many of us have the opportunity to do that, but we do have the opportunity to participate with her on this side of the globe. And how we can do that is through prayer and through intentional prayer. And so what I would like to do is we're going to have a sign-up sheet out in the lobby at the table right by the first-time visitor's um, sign. And I would like for you to sign up for a specific day that you are going to commit to pray for Emily while she's gone on her trip. You will sign up on this sheet. So I have a list, and so we have each day covered. There's one more. There's two more steps for you with that. One is sign up. Two, there is a little note reminder that you can fill in that has you just put in your date and you take it off the clipboard and you or off the little set and you take it with you. So you remember what day you signed up for. Then the last thing and. And just as important as prayer is letting Emily know and giving her encouragement. Prayer is massive. She also needs that verbal encouragement from her church body. So what we're asking is for you to do a, either a card for her or a, an encouragement note. And then on, and put it in an envelope. On the outside of the envelope, this is important, write the date you are praying for her. 
Because what we're going to do is we're going to send a package with her that each day she can open a card from her church family, encouraging her and letting her know who's praying for her. So we're going to have the sign-up sheet. There's, I think, like 23 days. So if you want to sign up individually or as family members, that however you feel led, and then I will be contacting people individually once it, it, to fill in extra. So this will be at the back table. Um, just, again, your name. Take your card that has your date on it. And then by May 15th, just so we have enough time to get everything together, so the week after Mother's Day, so we have two weeks, bring in a card or a note. It doesn't have to be a card. Just something in a, a note of encouragement in an envelope. On the outside of the envelope, what are you guys going to put? Perfect. You guys are awesome. I'm going to put this at the back, and so you guys can all sign up. Thanks so much. It is always exciting to uh, be able to send missionaries. Uh, that's what we see in the book of Acts. Uh, the churches are sending people to go and proclaim the gospel, and uh, so it is a great privilege to be able to do that here at Bethel. Well, this morning as I was looking for a series to start next, I, I wanted to do a study on the minor prophets. Uh, the prophets, the minor prophets are not called minor prophets because they are insignificant uh, they are called minor prophets because the books that they write are shorter. We don't know as much about these prophets as we do some of the major prophets. Uh, for some of the books, they contain such little information, such little background, that we have a difficult time getting a precise date of when they were actually prophets of the Lord. When you look through the Bible, we are very familiar with the New Testament uh, the New Testament, that the, or the churches teach the New Testament. We should be, because we are a New Testament people. Uh, God has revealed himself to us in the person of his son. Uh, Jesus came as flesh and blood, and he showed God to us in ways that had never been done before, never will be done again. And because of what Jesus did, we have forgiveness of sin. We have a relationship with God the Father. And, and we should be spending most of our time in the New Testament because we are a New Testament people. But just because we are a New Testament people does not mean that we neglect the books of the Old Testament. The 39 books of the Old Testament are just as much the Word of God as the 27 books of the New Testament. But tells me, tell me if this sounds familiar to you. Uh, you start your Bible reading plan. You go through Genesis and Exodus easily enough. You you struggle through Leviticus, and uh, you get through Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, there's the battles that are in Joshua. There's this evil that happens in Judges. First and Second Samuel, you read about Saul and David. You read about Solomon a little bit in First Kings, and then you get lost. Uh, too many strange names, too many unfamiliar places. We just don't understand the background of what's going on and what God's doing. And, you know, we, we understand Pharisees and Sadducees because we keep getting taught that, but we're not taught much on the background of the Old Testament prophets. You know, we read through Psalms and Proverbs, read about Daniel in Babylonian captivity, rebuilding Jerusalem and Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, we, but when it comes to the book of prophecy, these seem completely foreign to us, uh, other than the book of Jonah. You know, we know the book of Jonah. He gets swallowed by a great fish, and uh, so, of course, you know, that prophet stands out. He's the pouty prophet. But for the most part, the only connection that we have to the prophets is when the New Testament references back to the Old Testament prophets, and we see how that prophecy is fulfilled in the New Testament. And even when we have a Bible reading plan, we sometimes just speed through the prophets because we just don't understand, and we just want to be able to check the list saying, yes, I finished the prophets. I finished this reading. And, and really our understanding of the prophets is, comes down to, they have a message of this three parts. You know, they, they tell Israel about their sin. They, the prophets announce that God's going to send judgment. And then the prophets also announce the coming of the Messiah. Well, and in some sense, that is the message of the prophets. But within those messages, the prophets reveal the character of God. They tell us about a God who loves his rebellious people, 
He loves them so deeply that he reveals his plans to them. God calls his people to repentance, and his plan is to bring reconciliation and unity between himself and his people. We also see in the prophets God's power, God's sovereignty over all the nations. And in that time, the gods, the, the little g gods, were seen as regional gods. You know, there was the God of this territory or the God of that territory. But the God of the Bible, the God, is not limited by geography. The prophets spoke God's words to the Hebrew people and, and sometimes to the nations around his people. Samuel is considered the first prophet of Israel. There were others who were called prophets, some like Moses, but in Samuel, God really creates this office of prophet, and it functions differently than the prophet had functioned before. Before the prophets, what we see is the judges. The judges would act on behalf of God. They would bring rescue. They would bring deliverance to the people of Israel because the other nations had attacked Israel. They had conquered them. They were oppressing the people of Israel. And so God would send his spirit on these judges who would overcome Israel's oppressors. And so while the judges acted for God, the prophets speak for God. They have the word of God. And so the words of God come through the prophets to the people, and to the kings. Samuel serves as that bridge. He is the bridge between the judges and the prophets. So he is the last of the judges, and he is the first of the prophets. In 1 Samuel seven fifteen, we read that Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And in 1 Samuel three twenty, we read that Israel knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. So he is both the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. So God's doing something different. He, he's making this transition from judges to prophets. And in this transition, we see God do something very miraculous in 1 Samuel chapter 1. We read about God setting the stage for how he is going to communicate with his people for the next six, seven hundred years. So let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're going to start with verses 1 and 2. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. There was a certain man of Ramathame Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jerome, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. As you read the Bible, you encounter these times when there's a couple that is unable to conceive a child. Uh, there are many couples who struggle with this issue, but in Scripture, when we see this, we know that God is preparing to do something absolutely amazing, absolutely miraculous. His supernatural work is being prepared. We think of Abraham and Sarah. We think of Isaac, Rebecca. We think of Samson's parents. In the New Testament, we have Zechariah and Elizabeth, and Elizabeth gives birth to John the Baptist. These women are unable to conceive children, and when we understand that, we see that God has a special plan for the children that they will later have. In the case of Elkanah and Hannah, God is changing the way that he will engage his people. Even if you've never read these verses before, there's an anticipation that God is going to do something here. We see a lot of description for this man, Elkanah. It suggests that he has some level of wealth, that he has some social standing. We see the, his line, his uh, genealogy. And while it's not explicitly stated, it's implied that Hannah is Elkanah's first wife. Uh, he may have married Peninnah because Hannah was unable to have children, and in order to carry on his family line, he needed an heir, and so he married this second woman. And so this idea that he has a second wife supports the idea that he is a wealthy man. He's able to sustain two, uh, two wives, two families, in essence. We also see that he is a spiritual man. He leads his family in worshiping the Lord. He takes them. He is the one who initiates taking them to worship, making sacrifices to the Lord. Look at verses 3 through 7. 
1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina and his, his wife and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. And so it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used, she used to provoke her. And therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. So Elkanah would take his family with his two wives, all the children that Peninnah had, and they would go to worship in Shiloh. We see great concern for his family, but we see that he has he loves Hannah. He gives her a double portion. He gives her extra for her sacrifice. And you can just hear the ridicule that Hannah is forced to endure. She's unable to have children, and so she's outcast by the culture. There's this gossip that's going on. Uh, to be childless in this culture is a sign of judgment, a sign of shame. You clearly did something wrong. God's not going to bless you with children because you did something wrong. And on top of all the shame from the culture and all the whispering, Hannah had to endure torment and ridicule from the other woman, her husband's other wife. And, and you can hear the scorn that comes through. You know, you know here's Panetta talking to her children. Well, I'm sorry, I can't do that right now. Mommy's really busy. Hannah, can you come over here and help me? These kids keep me so busy, I just don't know what I'm going to do. It's so hard keeping all of these mouths fed. By the way, did I tell you that I'm pregnant again? And this explains why I've been so tired. I'm so glad you don't have children of your own so that you can help me with my children. And you can just hear the scorn and the ridicule that comes out. Verse 7 says that Penina would provoke Hannah year after year. The shame just continues to compound. Going back to verse 3, we have an interesting description of the Lord. He is called the Lord of hosts. This is Jehovah Sabaoth. The New Living Translation translates it as the Lord of heaven's armies. It's the idea of the Lord being in charge of angelic armies. It's a military idea. And that seems like a strange description for God in this context. We're talking about a childless woman. And we read about God who is the Lord of angels' armies, or armies of angels. And this is the first time we see in Scripture this name for the Lord. It, the name for the Lord used uh, this way is 266, or 260 times in the Old Testament and so it seems that part of this worship in Shiloh is connected to this name of the Lord. It's the idea that God is the almighty king. He rules, he reigns in power. When you consider that in this book that God gives Israel a king, it seems this, this is an important reminder that no matter who occupies the throne of Israel, God is still king. Israel's king will sit under the authority of the Lord of hosts. Look at verse, sixes, verse 6 and 7. Uh, both of these verses, both verse 6 and 7, end with the words, the Lord had closed her womb. The writer of 1 Samuel did not want us to miss this. It's the fact that the Lord closed Hannah's womb. It's such an important fact that we have it recorded twice for us, right back to back. Hannah's childlessness is not because Hannah had sin or because God was judging her. It's because God had a plan. Part of that plan meant getting people's attention with a very special birth. Here's a woman unable to have children. And we know later she's going to have a child. And that leads to the question, what is God's plan for this child? What is God doing? 
In that culture, people wondered, you know, what this childless woman had done wrong? What sin had she committed? Why is God judging her? Why does Hannah's rival have all these children when Hannah has no children? And we have similar struggles today. Maybe not with childlessness, but we just struggle when life doesn't seem to go our way. And, and that story on Lazarus and, and the response, you know, what is God doing? Am I really trusting God? Fits very well with this passage. You know, I, I've prayed for God to heal me on this issue or that issue. You know, why is God not hearing me? Why is my cancer still here? Why is my mom or my dad still suffering with this illness? Why doesn't God bless me the way he blessed this person or, or that person? You know, here I am. I'm trying to live a life that honors God, that's obedient to God. And it seems like the wicked are the ones who keep having all the blessings. Why does God bless those who are evil? And the temptation is to think that something's wrong. You know, if we suffer in this life or if we have struggles of any kind, well, then clearly we're outside the will of God. And there are false teachers out there who reinforce this. They say that, well, God has to heal you. He must heal you. You know, just have enough faith. And God will be obligated to heal you. That's a lie. God doesn't obey us. God doesn't have to answer our prayers that way. If you're truly a person of faith, then you would trust what God is doing. God never stopped working. God has a plan. God has a purpose. The person who has faith puts their faith in the Lord. So they submit to him, submit to his will. And it's that prayer, not my will, but your will be done. We pray it in the Lord's prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. A person of faith wants God's will to be done more than their own desires. And now here we are in 1 Samuel chapter 1. We know God has a plan. We know that God is preparing to do something great for his people. Anna doesn't know this yet. She only knows that she's hurting. She's in pain. In verse 7, she's in such anguish that she doesn't eat. She is grieved over her barrenness. And in her grief, she turns to the Lord. It's a pattern for her. Year after year, she continues to go to Shiloh. She worships the Lord. Circumstances didn't change, but still she continues to worship. And for some people... You know, they prayed once, and they didn't get what they asked for, and so they say, well, this prayer thing doesn't work. And then for others, well, they they pray for something about a week, and, well, I kept praying about it, but God never answered. And then there's the person who endures in prayer. This family went year after year to Shiloh to make their sacrifices. This is their worship. You know that Hannah prayed more than just this once a year when they made this trip. Every day, she's pouring her heart out to God. God, will you please answer? God, will you please answer? Answer this. Skip down to verse 9. Look at verses 9 through 18. 1 Samuel 1, verses 9 to 18. And after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow, saying, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, but only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman, And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking speaking out of my great anxiety and vexations. 
And then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. And then the woman went away and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Hannah goes to the temple of the Lord. And you can just feel the emotion as she offers this prayer. The Bible says she is deeply distressed, weeping bitterly, pouring out her soul. She has great anxiety and vexation. Have you ever prayed that way? Have you ever prayed something so deeply that other people would think you were drunk the way you were praying? Hannah took her troubles to the Lord. And clearly this is not the first time she has been praying for this. But in this moment, she is praying with all her might. Back in verse 11, Hannah prays to the Lord of hosts. Again, this is the Lord of armies of angels. And she prays to the God who is king over all the nations. He is the ruler over all of the angels. And she prays that this king over everything would show his kindness and his favor to her. And you may think, well, this God who rules over the universe would have such little time for someone as insignificant as this woman, Hannah. Why would he listen to her? Why would he listen to me? Why would he listen to you? Why would God be concerned with our lives at all, much less the details of our lives? Why would he be concerned the things that we may suffer? But we know that he is concerned. And not only is he the God of the heavenly angels, not only is he God, the ruler over over all the earth, God is also the one who was concerned enough that he closed Hannah's womb. He did this because he had a plan. God had a plan for how he would begin to communicate more directly with his people. God would take this child that Hannah would later bear and God would put his words into the mouth of this child. Her son would become the first prophet of the Lord. God would reveal his word to Samuel and Samuel would relay that word of the Lord to the people. God is concerned with the big picture of what's going on in the world. He's concerned not only with what's going on in the world, but he's concerned with what's going on in the heavenly realms But God is also concerned with what's going on with you. The situations that you face, the trials that you encounter, the anxiety, the distress that you feel. And just like Hannah turned to the Lord in faith, the Lord is asking for you to turn to him as well. He wants you to trust him, to trust him, to trust his plan. And his plan may be for healing, or it might not be. And as you turn to him, Understand that God has three answers to prayer. God can answer yes, God can answer no, or God can answer not yet. And just because the answer is no, that's still an answer. Last summer, a good friend was diagnosed with cancer. He hadn't felt well, and after a family trip, he went to the doctor, found out he had an aggressive form of cancer. Within two months, he was put in hospice, and within a week, he had died. I had another friend, also diagnosed with cancer. The doctor told him, you have six months to live. That was about 10 years ago, and he's still going strong. Why does God work one way for one person and then work a different way for another person? Why does God work the way that he does? Well, I don't pretend to know the answer to that. There's no formula for it. Both of these men were very godly men. They feared the Lord. They prayed to the Lord. They trusted the Lord. Why did God answer one with healing and one not healed? And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, will we trust the Lord no matter what? Will you trust his plan even when that plan is uncomfortable? Maybe that plan is painful right now, but will you continue to trust God had a plan to use Hannah. God was changing the way that he communicated with his people. Hannah's son would be the first of the prophets. Hannah submitted herself to the Lord, even pledged to surrender this child to the Lord's service. 
Hannah models what it means to surrender to the Lord. Will you also submit yourself to the Lord? We have the benefit of being able to read and, and know how everything worked out for Hannah. We see how God used her son Samuel. We see countless examples of others throughout Scripture. They also trusted in the Lord's plan, whether it is Hannah or Abraham or Joseph. They all trusted in the Lord's plan. The Lord changed things with the prophet Samuel. But that, still that plan that he had was limited. It was preparation for a bigger plan. God used the prophets for about six, 700 years in the history of Israel. God used the prophets to share his eternal plan, his lasting plan. God's unchanging plan is that he sent his one and only son to be our prophet, our priest, and our king. Just as God the Father is Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is also the prophet who proclaimed the word of the Lord. As God, he spoke directly with the people. He had the words of God because he is God. Jesus is also priest. And as priest, Jesus made an eternal sacrifice for all who will believe. Jesus laid down his life, the perfect, the blameless, the innocent sacrifice. And he paid the penalty for our sin. This morning, we have the privilege of being able to remember the sacrifice that he made for us in communion. We remember that he willingly laid down his life to purchase our redemption and to give us his righteousness. So before our time of communion this morning, just pray silently where you are. If there's any sin that you need to confess, this is the time to confess that again silently where you are. Any doubts that you have been struggling with, maybe you've been trying to do things your own way and getting angry that God's not responding the right way, this is the time to confess that, acknowledge that before God. Acknowledge that maybe I think my plan is better than God's plan, and so I just want to repent of that. So just pray silently where you are, and I will close us in just a moment. Father, we confess that too many times we have doubts. Uh, we wonder what you are doing. We question that. Uh, we think you should respond in one way, and we don't submit ourselves to your plan and your will. I pray that you would forgive us for that, that you would help us to grow in our faith, to grow in our confidence that you are working and moving and that your plan is perfect. I pray that you would Show us what it means to surrender fully to all that you are doing. I thank you for Hannah, uh, just her commitment to you to continue to pray after all these years, to not be bitter and hold it against you, but to pray and to seek your intervention. And Lord, I thank you that you did intervene, that we were unable to save ourselves, but you intervened by sending your son. Thank you for his perfect work on the cross, for his sacrifice for us, for his resurrection. We have access to you. We can pray to you only because of what he has done. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Well, as part of communion, you do not have to be a member of Bethel in order to participate, but you do need to have a personal relationship with Christ. And so you, you are welcome to join us as we remember the sacrifice of Christ as long as you have that personal relationship. Children are welcome to participate as well uh, under the guidance of their parents. If you believe that your child has made that profession of faith as well, they are welcome to participate. Paul gives instructions to the Corinthian church on how to observe communion. 
And he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul continues, and he writes, In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the sacrifice of Christ. I thank you that your plan is perfect, that you laid out everything for us, uh, that you have done everything for us. I thank you that you communicated this plan through your prophets. Uh, just your word was revealed. And I pray, God, that we would continue to study your word, that we would know that all of the word you have given us, the entire Bible, is relevant for us today. We don't have to make it relevant. It is relevant. And so I pray that we would submit ourselves to the truth of your word and that you would continue to transform us. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand with us as we sing?
What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. like to know more about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus 
uh, to have your sins forgiven, uh, please find me or one of our deacons, elders, after service. We'd love to share with you more about Christ and what he has done for us. If you're watching online, you can go to our website at BethelSI.org, and there's a button that says Ask for Prayer, and you can just fill that out with your contact information so we can get back in touch with you. At this time, I'd like to dismiss uh, all the children and children's workers to go downstairs for the children's church. Uh, that will be meeting at the back uh, stairs by the lo- in the lobby by the stairs, and uh, you're welcome to go down for that. Just a reminder also, we are praying for Emily. We want to continue to pray for her, and there'll be a sign-up sheet in the lobby um, on the table that you can sign up for a specific day that you would like to pray for Emily while she is in Cambodia. Let's bow for our benediction this morning. Now may the God of peace, who brought up again from their dead the shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, may he equip you with every good thing that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.